If you've been in the audio industry for longer than about four minutes, you've probably run into some sort of voodoo or hearsay. Someone's really convicted about a particular product or method changing the world. When we start to dig out, it, it, it really doesn't hold any weight. We might say the this measurement microphone is the flattest thing in the world, so you're going to get the best data. Or this particular speaker brand has speakers that are able to steer low mids without any phase alterations. You know, it's... You know, it really has to be fact checked at the end of the day. And that's what I want to do today is talk about some common myths that, that, that I used to believe about system tuning before I really dove into it. I'm not saying you have to have a PhD to understand all of this, but it does take some thought and experience and math to really understand what is going on. If you really want to level up your game when it comes to understanding sound this way, I have my audio math survival spreadsheet. It's at the link below, or you can get it at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. It helps you really understand how frequency is related to a period, wavelength, and samples. It can help you calculate phase delay, and this is really useful for aligning mains and subs. It helps you understand decibels, comb filters, whether or not you need delay speakers, how to space front fills, line length cutoff, yeah, how can you actually steer low frequencies? Anyway, that's all there for you. I would love for you to get it and put it to work to you on your show so you can start to get real results, predict what's going on, and ultimately make everything sound better for your clients and your audience. So let's jump right into seven myths that we need to drop as an industry about sound system tuning. Our first myth we have is sound system tuning gear is expensive, even for beginners. If you haven't seen it already, I've got a video on the channel called Build a Sound System Tuning Rig for Under $250. And even with milk, egg, and gas going crazy and inflation and supply chain, you can still get this entire rig for under $250. I might need to update these prices. But you get the audio interface, how you get the audio into your computer, a measurement microphone, how you capture sound, all the necessary cabling, the XLRs and such, and then the audio analyzer software, all for 250 bucks. And the software is open sound meter, is open source, and is a pay what you want model. And it's really easy to use and geared towards someone who doesn't want to get overwhelmed with menus. I've got a complete tutorial on that. Just Google open sound meter tutorial, my name, and you'll be able to find it or just look at my channel. All that being said, the, the barrier to entry used to be cost prohibitive. Uh, I'm not trying to pick on any software manufacturer. All the softwares that are out there that are worth $1,000, $1,200, $1,400 are worth it. I own them. <laughs> so I, I use Smart all the time. It's a fantastic piece of software, but that does make a high barrier to entry for some. So this software I think is great. You can really get professional results with it as well. I'm not saying it's a Fisher Price toy, but if you want to jump in and start trying to dive into under understand what's going on here, I would get open sound meter as well as the rest of the gear in this kit. Again, invest a half day worth of wages and be able to buy back and earn yourself so many more types of gigs or just do that much better of a job of the gigs you're on so that you get more. A well worth it investment in my opinion. Next, it doesn't really matter where you put your subs. This is a, is a fun myth. We just think, ah, oh, it's just the subs. It's just the low end. It's just going to bounce around everywhere. It doesn't really matter. But I'm going to illustrate that that is far from the case. So here is a show. We have a stage here in pink that is smaller and a audience that's a little bit wider than it is deep. And we have four subs on this show. And let's th run through four different common configurations. So here's the first one our typical left-right setup. I'm not trying to pick on left-right. Sometimes you have to do it, but just know this is what you're going to get. You're going to get a power alley down the middle, and it's going to sum again and move out. And to be clear, this is at 63 hertz. It's going to look different at 100 hertz versus 31 hertz. So that is left-right. And this effect is going to be felt more outside because you don't have the room for giving you by having all these reflections. So if you're outside, I really try not to do left-right. Again, sometimes it's what you got to do. Let's look at a different one that I see commonly. Let's just place the subs evenly in front of the stage. So they're all right here, spaced evenly in front. It looks nice from an aesthetic standpoint, but here is the response. We get this one giant beam barreling down the middle. <laughs> and then all these people here on the sides are left with zilch. 
So if I had a long skinny room, I would definitely go for this array. This array is not wrong or this placement is not wrong in and of itself. It's just not the right fit for this audience. So I'd argue the theme here is make sure you have a sub setup that is gonna cover your audience the best. And so the rig that I would advocate is the best here would be a modification of the inline gradient cardioid subarray. And this one is actually a four element. I'll show you a picture here in a second, but it is moving and its shape is perfectly matching the width here, moving out through the audience. And yes, I do see that here in the back, it's not covered as well, but I just wanted to be clear that the subs are on the ground. Anywhere we go, it's gonna have a hard time being as loud in the back as it is in the front because of the inverse square law. So, but this covers it most evenly as it moves throughout the audience from both a horizontal and level perspective. So this is what that setup actually looks like. I got to deploy it in several shows. It is a four element in light cardioid subarray. And these subs are actually facing in towards each other. And it is a four foot spacing from the center of this driver to the center of this one, just like you would on an inline cardioid sub gradient. You can do anywhere between two and four and a half feet, depending on your subwoofer size and the frequency you want. Anyway, that's a fun array and it does matter where you put your subs. Low frequencies deserve to have the same coverage shape as high frequencies if you can get it with the rig you have. Next, the majority of the work happens in the field. What I mean by this is that there is this obsession in so many crafts to focus on post-production, what you can fix with tools after the fact. No one likes watching tutorials on music arrangement and recording. It's all about mixing or mastering. It's after I do my stuff, how can I fix it later? People love Photoshop, but not getting a affordable camera, learning how to take really good pictures. So same thing with sound system design versus tuning. People want to learn about tuning, learning the software, where I put my microphone, and they don't want to learn the physics it actually takes to make a good design. So here's a show, I got the engineer, and we have our flown left mains, a 12 box line array, 12 box line array, and then some front fills here, here, here. And I had to cover this entire bowl, mainly we just, and the floor with mainly these two flown arrays. And that, that's a pretty tall order, but I was able to make it happen and verify that it worked with software and prediction. Because I know how line arrays work, how they couple, how they're going to move. This is a three octave weighting at 4K. And everything that you see here that is green is within a plus or minus 3 dB span. So the vast majority of the audience, except for these few front sections, are all within a plus or minus 3 dB span. And then I can use EQ on those bottom boxes to bring down the high frequencies. And that ended up being the majority of the EQ that he used in the field was a high shelf, bringing some of the high frequencies down. And then he used a low shelf uh, to take care of some of the, some people call array morphing or just the low end buildup from that many boxes being together uh, because this box didn't have a preset or a processor. And I was able to do that with a low shelf and get it to where my target curve was. So anyway, focus on design first, and that's gonna be 90% of the battle. The last 10% is in the field when you're tuning and aligning. Tuning and aligning is very important. No one likes delay speakers that are flaming with the mains, right? So it's an important school skill they need to get right, but get design right first. Next myth, I should tune a sound system flat. So here are the three target curves that I use regularly. I have others, but just pulled these out uh, of my hat. The white one is I got from Michael Lawrence. And if I'm tuning like a big, large scale system, the system is already near this response, that's my target curve. The green one I got from Nathan Lively. That one's similar to how L Acoustics voices their systems. It's a little bit different, but it starts to rise at 1K steadily up. Michael Lawrence's weights till about 300 Hertz, then slopes up. And this last one that's yellow starts at 1K and only slopes up about 60B and does not have a bump for the subs. All three of these curves are useful in different situations. And it's pretty common. I mean, I haven't seen many large scale music systems that don't have some sort of low end bump, whether they start the tilt earlier, but it's either tilting up or down the system response to get there. So yeah, I would say that, you know, tuning flat is good for a studio environment if you want to start there but in a live environment you're almost always going to have some low end buildup but here's the inverse of that flat systems sound terrible i read this or hear people say 
advocate against system tuning because they think flat is bad. And that couldn't be farther from the case earlier. This is a room I got to do a show in. It's called the Great Hall at the Crystal Bridges American Museum. Uh, American Museum, Amer- Museum Museum of American Art. Now I can talk. And as you can see, it's concrete, wa- a polished, smooth concrete, these wood beams with metal behind it, and glass walls. Every single surface in here is incredibly reflective. And after putting a system in here, and the show being primarily dialogue, I'm not needing this big, low-end beef. And so when I tuned the system, I almost got it completely flat from 16K all the way down to 100. And and that made for the most amount of intelligibility with that rig. And I was prepared to add in some beef if people got out there with handhelds and it sounded too thin, but it sounded fine. There were just, that room in particular had so much reflections happening. Again, there aren't a whole lot of completely parallel surfaces, so it wasn't a bunch of flutter, but the the decay time and how long the low mids took to die out took forever, so it made sense to have a system that was flat. So all that being said, your system's target curve is show and room dependent. So sometimes it needs to be steep like that and have a lot of low end punch, and sometimes it needs to be flat to make sure that your, your vocal clarity and your dialogue clarity isn't being drowned out in 250 hertz. All right, next myth, system tuning takes a long time. So here's a checklist I made for a show when I uh, was tuning a, a, a larger system for a commencement, and it does look like a lot of, of checkpoints just for prep and what to do with the mains and the subs. The thing is, system tuning takes a long time when you aren't prepared and you don't have an overarching paradigm in mind. I have a system and process for every sound system that I approach. I move in the same order with the same com- components every time. And that creates a rhythm and that gets me in a groove. If you're just walking up, opening it up smart or open sound meter or whatever, and don't have any type of plan, it doesn't have to be this detailed with a bunch of bullet points or even an overarching framework, you're going to move slow. So a system should not take longer than 30 minutes, in my, in my opinion. Even, uh, you know, if you're tuning a new install at a baseball stadium with 100 delay speakers, that's going to take a long time. But your normal run of the mill, left, right, few subs and front fills, if you're taking longer than 30 minutes regularly, unless you're very new, that's a problem. You need to move quickly, make a checklist like this, work from it, get quick. And then as you get used to working from this and get into these patterns, then you'll be able to do it from memory and move quickly. All right, here we are ending it here. EQ makes every rig sound the same. So under this is maybe it doesn't matter the quality of speaker I get because I can use EQ to correct for it. And the proliferation and the ubiquity of FIR filters in processing now for speakers has somewhat seeded this myth. I would probably, if you talk to an FIR filter designer, they are not proliferating this, but folks out in the field who don't understand it are. Um, It's also being borrowed from a studio environment. So this is a piece of software called Sound ID Reference from Sonarworks. And you place a measurement microphone in your room at 30 different spots, I think about 30, and it measures it and gives you a curve that changes your system's response to sound great at the listening position. And this is only true for your listening position, nowhere else. So this is a great piece of software for just me in my studio to make it sound great, right? But this is not telling me how it got to this response, whether it was trying to solve a timing problem or an actual EQ problem, it's just applying a curve. So an EQ can get something that's closer to flat or neutral, but it's not the end all be all. A a room is going to color the response. The transient response is different with each speaker. Its coverage pattern is different. The reflections off the floor. So you could put the same style of rig, a dual 12 line array from L acoustics next to a D and B rig, and they are going to sound completely different, even if they are tuned to the same target curve. They will sound similar in their tonality, but how that speaker couples together, works with its friends, its unique coverage, its way its drivers interact with the air are going to be different. So an EQ curve or a target curve is only one facet of the sound. So that's why you need to get it to a target curve and then walk, listen, and evaluate. I would not have trusted myself a while back to make a system completely flat um, if I had 
not say like, well, this is what's sounding best for this context. So sometimes use your ear to not override, but cr- maybe fine tune what's happening with the data that you're seeing on the screen. Anyway, that's it. That's seven myths worth busting. Thank you so much for hang- hanging out with me today. What I'd love for you to do below is comment on which myth are, are you currently believing or which one needs to be busted for you. Uh, for me, I believe most of these at some point in my past, I'm not saying I'm, I'm above all, but which one has either given you trouble that, or maybe you've been believing for a little bit. My name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for watching. I will catch you next time.